Here are my five top tips to help you not just survive your first ultra marathon, but to help you thrive and enjoy it, which is by far the most important point. And I used this strategy by accident in my first ultra marathon, which was 50K uphill. And then I refined the process to make it even better, which led me to going on to racing 100K as fast as I possibly could, winning the British Championships in six hours 42, and representing my country. So you get the refined version. You don't have to make the mistake and you don't have to try trial and error. You can go straight to the refined version. Number one is don't make the first mistake that I made in my first ultra marathon. You've got to make sure that the race is far enough away for you to train appropriately so that not only can you survive it, but you can tackle the distance and ideally you can race it. Because essentially this is, it's still a race. It's an ultra marathon, it's far, but you're trying to get the best out of your body over that distance. So you're trying to go as fast as you possibly can. For my first ultra marathon, I, fr I finished a 10K in May 2010, and then somebody invited me to a 50K uphill, which I didn't even know existed. I thought it only went up to a marathon. All of a sudden, my mind was opened by 50 kilometers uphill, and the cutoff time was eight hours. So my only goal was to get there two months later and be able to do it in less than eight hours. So I had eight weeks to train. So first, and formal point is plan the race so that it's far enough away so that you can properly do the right training so you can set yourself up for success. And the right training is number two. You've got to build the volume in the week. So you've got to hardwire that consistency and discipline and make sure that you're getting up in the morning, first thing you think about, first thing you do is go out for a run, whether it's a recovery run, easy run, long run, hill run, tempo run, interval session, that's what you do. Once that's hardwired and you're building the structure, you're building the volume of the week and always go by the 10% rule. Works and every fourth week, pull it back so you can freshen up the body and the mind to be able to go for the next four weeks. Once you're starting to see that volume grow, naturally, organically, what should be growing within the week is your long run which is the biggest indicator of your success in ultra running. Even if you're trying to race for the win, you've got to have the endurance and stamina. You've got to be able to go out there and specifically over the terrain or the surface that you're training for to race on, you've got to be able to go for long periods of time. So how long should the long run be? Now for me, 50 kilometers uphill meant that I was living in Sweden and I didn't have access to hills. I lived in the flattest part of Sweden. But what I did have access to, and luckily it was an uphill only race, was I had access to a treadmill. So I would go and run on a treadmill at 6% gradient and just start extremely slow and gradually build up. Just as it was a new skill, which is exactly how you should look at it, it is a new skill that you're building build up going slow or going uphill, whatever the race is you're training for. So look at the profile of the race, look at the surface and the terrain of the race, look at the downhills as well as the uphills, and train specifically and simulate that long run to look as close to the race as possible. So always look at the goal and work back. But how long should the long run be? What I figured out or what I wanted to achieve was finishing in less than the cutoff time of eight hours. And so what I planned in my head was if, planned in my head, not in my feet, is if I can get to halfway and run to halfway in three hours, then that will take me to 25K within three hours, which will give me five hours to walk 25K, which I can walk five kilometers an hour, even going uphill. That was my plan. So I planned to get to 25K, which is exactly what I did in training. So I ran for three hours on a treadmill at 6% and got to 25K, and that was my training. That was as basic and all the newbie errors that you could possibly make in thinking and also practice, but I had a limited time to deal with the training that I needed to put together in order to be able to 
optimize my performance on race day, but it worked because what happens is once you're racing, you have got a special energy that comes with race day energy. You're running with people. It's a celebration of the human spirit. It's a celebration of you. It's a celebration of all the hard work that you've put in before. So there is a special race day energy. Are you gonna be able to train to run a three hour marathon and all of a sudden turn up, use that special energy and run 210? No, you're not gonna be able to do that. But that, whether you call it anxiety, nerves, excitement, fight or flight mode, it gives you something on race day that you will feed into. And if you can feed into that and learn to feed in, into it, it's a superpower. It can also debilitate you. So if you get extremely nervous before races to the point where two, three nights before you can't sleep, that's gonna lead to all sorts of worries. And if you focus on a problem, it will get bigger and bigger and bigger. Whereas if you take away those problems and potential issues because you have complete confidence in your process, then they diminish and they become something that you don't think at all. So you can focus on what really matters, which in this case is you running over the ground slow enough in order to make the distance. Number three, don't make this mistake that I made in my first ultramarathon also. And learn from what I implemented in the subsequent years in order to make myself a completely different athlete that was able to run for long periods of time without getting tired and able to run quickly for long periods of time without burning glycogen as a primary fuel source, burning fat. And the way that I did that over those years when I refined the process and became a much better marathon runner and ultra marathon runner is I did two things very, very well. The first thing I did was most of my running, my easy runs, recovery runs were all fasted meaning I did them first thing in the morning, drank water, went out and ran, and whether it was 40 minutes, an hour, an hour and 20, it was all fasted. Exactly the same when I was riding a bicycle. And what that does is helps your body to tap into fat as a primary fuel source rather than glycogen when you're out there running at lower intensities. What it also does is raises the heart rate that you're able to operate, so the effort level you're able to put in and still tap into that fat reserve as primary fuel source rather than glycogen, which saves your glycogen for when you really need it, which is later on in a race or when you're running faster. What I also did was implemented a way better nutrition plan for before and during the race. And so what I was playing with with was a gel every 40 minutes. And that was 37.5 grams of carbohydrates every hour. What I learned, and it took me way too long to learn this, so please learn it, implement it, keep it there forever, because once you've used this method, you will never turn back, because you'll realize how powerful it is in a race, but how powerful it is in training too. When I started to work with 80 grams of carbohydrate, so more than twice the amount of carbohydrate per hour, what I learned was there was no wall because the wall is you running out of glycogen and you're not going to do that if you can get 80 grams of carbohydrate in per hour, but not only have it sloshing around in your stomach, but also using it, letting the muscles use it as energy to propel you forward. That is, absolutely imperative for your ultra marathon and for your marathon running, but it also incredibly helps the training. So if you've got that working for you in a hard interval session or in a long run, not only are you practicing with that race day fuel, but also you're stopping the level of muscle break breakdown that you would get from that hard interval session or from that long run because it's essentially preventative maintenance. You're stocking up the glycogen before you're depleting it. And so there's not as much muscle damage at the end of a hard session or a long session. That frees up your mind to go harder in an interval session and to go either harder or longer in a long run or a specific long run. And that is dynamite. Number four, and my fingers are wonky because I've broken my hand a few times. Running is about everything and anything apart from running. 
And once you realize that, and once the penny drops, it will be so obvious that it frees up your mind to many, many opportunities. And what I mean by that is running is who you are. It's your work ethic. It's your tenacity. It's your drive, dedication, determination. It's your consistency and discipline. It's your understanding of delayed gratification. All of those things make up character and a way more useful outside of running than inside of running, but will serve you really well in running. So what you're essentially doing when you're training to run ultra distance, marathon running, 5K, 10K, is you're building mental strength. And as a byproduct, physically you're improving, physiologically you're improving. But the primary goal is to build mental strength. That's why I love running so much. If it was just about you moving over the ground, it wouldn't be as interesting. But it's the mental strength that you build. And when you're training for an ultramarathon, you kind of have to visualize what it's gonna be like out there. Maybe there's only 100 people in the race. Maybe you've entered a, 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 a really small, old ultramarathon where it's a small field, and for most of the next 10, 12, 15 hours, you're out there on your own. And it makes absolutely no sense because a lion is not chasing you, you don't have to run for food, you've got money in your pocket, you could go to the shop and get enough calories. It doesn't make sense for us as human beings. But it's a test of character. And if you visualize long, lonely periods of time on your own, where you're thinking, who am I? What am I all about? Who am I when nobody's watching? That's character. And if you can tap into that side and understand that for the next 10, 15 hours, it's just me versus me, and not only am I gonna get through it, but I'm also gonna embrace it, and I'm gonna embody everything that running is about, the work ethic, the tenacity, the consistency, the discipline. That's the most important thing about running, and especially about ultramarathon running. Number five. The final point and a big mistake that I made in my first ultramarathon and I corrected once I figured it out, but you can learn from me right now, implement it and again you will never move back, is most people will train on the surface and the terrain that they've got access to and not think about the goal. And this matters in almost every situation. So if you're going to run 100k on the road, or if you're going to run a marathon even on the road, what will happen in that final 20K especially, but the final third of both of those races, you're using the same muscles in the same way for long periods of time on the tarmac, which has very, very little give. And so eventually, what will pro you'll probably feel it first is the quads. So you're going to get initially that dull ache where you're like, mm, this is uncomfortable, but suffering, it's part of the game, I'm moving forward. And then it will get to a point, especially in an ultramarathon, where you can no longer move forward because it's too painful. It's too painful to hit the ground. And so you want to stop and walk. And that might finish your race because you might miss the cutoff, the cutoff time, which will not only sort of destroy you in the moment, but will also mean that you don't have the performance and the data to look back on, so you cannot then continually improve. You'll only have some of the data available. If it's technical and you're going to be out there for 100 miles or 50 miles and it's very technical trail and all you're running has been on smooth buttery trail or tarmac or the treadmill, again it's going to be way more taxing. And what you're going to find out is all the stability muscles that you need to run on technical terrain your ankles are going to be in trouble, your knees are going to be in trouble, your hips are going to be in trouble, but your muscles are going to be in trouble as well. And especially if it's undulating, those downhills and the uphills will eventually get you and your Achilles will feel it, but your quads are going to feel it first. My faster runs and my longer runs were all then on the surface that I was going to race on. So if that was tarmac, they were done on tarmac. If it was a trail, I looked in detail at the trail and prepared for it. Sometimes when you get it wrong, and I did recently get it wrong in, in Arizona, you will not have access to the surface. And so 
there's no preparation you can do. And especially if you've never run on anything like it before, it's gonna be a shock to the system to the point where you can only try to survive it. You're not going to, you might enjoy the challenge, but you're not going to be, run, be able to run optimally. And in my case on that, I fell very early and had to finish after 20 miles. You don't want to do that because it's wasted time when you could be spending that time moving forward. A pro tip for being able to thrive on the surface and the distance is conditioning the body to tackle that final third, getting it ready to tackle that final third. If you're training for 100 miles, it's likely that you're not going to go out and run 70 miles on a regular basis. If you're training for 100K, you're not going to go out and run 70 kilometers on a regular basis. You might do once, but you're not going to do it on a regular basis unless you're racing other similar distances on the, on the lead up. What you can do is condition the quads to tackle long periods of time going flat, whether you're training for 100K, 100 miles, or a marathon, this will help you a lot, along with the nutrition. If you condition the quads by running downhill and getting them used to that dull ache, that pounding on the quads, they will adapt to be able to handle that pounding so you'll become a better downhill runner and you'll be able to become a better flat runner because that's not going to be a potential problem. And as I said before about problem, focusing on a problem and it becoming bigger, this is something that you no longer think about. Exactly the same with the nutrition. If you get those two areas right, you can become a good ultra marathon runner with the right training. What I'd also suggest you do, and this again comes with planning, is factor in other races as part of your training which is gonna get you used to running with other people, aid stations, drink stations, the, the gear that you need to wear potentially, but also it's gonna allow you to run distance, whether it's marathon, 50 miles if you're training for 100 miles, or further distance that is supported and you've got people around you, which is obviously great for safety, but also great to get those liquids in and gels and drop bags and things like that along the way that's going to make you a better racer and it's going to better prepare you to run quicker and last the distance during your A race. So those are my top tips for ultramarathon running. And if you implement them, you will not only survive on race day, but you're also going to have a lot of fun. What is the furthest you've ever run? Let me know in the comments below. What's the furthest you've ever run and what are you training for currently?